Okay, Tam Talks EV and RE. That's the title of our episode today. It's Energy 808, uh, The Cutting Edge. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Think Tech Hawaii. And the handsome young man on my, well, on the other screen is Tam Hunt. Hi, Tam. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about EVs and RE. Um, you're uh, an energy attorney, uh, energy policy attorney. It's very important that we to get a handle on this because, you know, like so many other things in our world, the information is disparate. It comes in fragments. It's hard to connect the dots. It's hard to, you know, develop an informed opinion about where we are on the line, on the, you know, the pathway um, to our goals. And for that matter, whether our goals are realistic and whether they are going to save us. Because if you draw a straight line, Without taking action, we go off the side. Humanity goes off the side. And right now, it just seems to me, and I want to start the show this way, is that to the extent that we hope to achieve um, de in, depend, um, independence from fossil fuel, we hope to make a contribution toward renewing the world, um, the planet, um, there are so many things that get in the way there's so many things that jump to the top of the priority list all day and every day that you wonder whether, you know, people are still thinking about renewable energy and whether they're doing anything about renewable energy. So hmm, you're somewhat optimistic. Um, tell us what is going on really in renewable energy, including electric vehicles. Yeah, well, thanks, Jay, for the introduction. And um, it's kind of a, it's an interesting spot to be in where I think we need to um, look at things like climate change and the environment and just kind of big picture issues that can seem overwhelming is to pay attention and be informed, um, but don't get so full of despair that you get paralyzed. And that's actually, I think, where a lot of us are at nowadays when it comes to climate change. It's kind of like, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. What do I do? And just kind of go into your shell and do nothing. What I'm saying, what I've been saying for a number of years now is, look, we can, in fact, do things personally. We are doing a lot collectively on the green energy transition. And there are a lot of uh, pieces of good news out there amid the doom and gloom. And, um, you know, here today, I talk mainly about the growth in electric vehicles um, and policy at the national state and local level on electric vehicles. So, you know, I mean, so, some good news for sure to go along with the doom and gloom is that um, President Biden did recently announce he's gonna be signing an executive order calling for half of all vehicle sales to be electric vehicles or other zero emissions vehicles by 2030. And he made this announcement a few days ago accompanied by a number of automakers who have also pledged to sell um, at least half of their vehicles um, by 2030 as electric vehicles. This is a massive shift in the last 10 years. You know, 10 years ago, you had the Nissan Leaf, and that was about it. That's about 90 miles of range. It's a great little car, but it's not for everyone. It's a pretty limited vehicle. We now have dozens of electric vehicles with 200 miles range or more, which are great cars. I don't want to brag, but it's got a Tesla Model Y. It's an amazing car. I had a Chevy Bolt for a few years, still have it. It's also an amazing car. Not quite as amazing as the Model Y, but I like it a lot. And um, we're seeing more and more of these cars come out and getting cheaper and cheaper, longer and longer range. And so, you know, rather than you know, collapsing into a ball on the ground in despair, you know, go buy an electric car, buy a hybrid car at the very least. Think about what you can do personally, you know, change your light bulbs out. Uh, elect politicians who can actually be uh, a force for positive change on the environment and climate change. There's a lot can be done. So I really want to kind of um, balance the, the momentum toward despair with the call to action, you know, both at the individual and the, the larger group level. Now, funny you should say that because we're making a movie about uh, the relationship of uh, climate change and COVID, um, and the interaction, the convergence, if you will. And of course, uh, COVID, you know, takes priority when it's life and death right now. But one of the um, one of the scientists who spoke was from Harvard. His name is Aaron Bernstein. And Bernstein, the words ring in my head. He said, um, "No city, no state, no country alone can solve climate change. It takes 
global effort you know, by everyone. Uh, and that means every individual person, uh, not necessarily cities and states and countries. So here we are in the United States, and we certainly uh, emit a lot of fossil fuels, um, but um, you know we're only one country. And there are a lot of countries that are worried about waking up in the morning. Um, and so it's not high in their priority list. And it, it does require global effort. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, so I followed the international climate uh, policy negotiations for literally 30 years. Um, I gave up on the UN process years ago because I followed it for 20 years and nothing had happened. Um, a few years ago, the Paris Accord was signed and it's better than nothing, but barely. It basically is a set of voluntary commitments to reduce emissions. And this is better than nothing, but it really is mostly symbolic. And so when Trump abnegated it, it wasn't really that big a deal. It was symbolic to begin with. When he abnegated it, it's symbolic again. Now that Biden's rejoining it, it's also symbolic. But symbolism is better than nothing. And here's where I'm optimistic again, is that we're actually, we are seeing market forces um, really kick in and achieve a lot of reductions in emissions through the very surprising growth of solar power, uh, better energy efficiency, and then in the last few years, a huge growth in electric vehicles. And so, you know, we are in fact seeing the green energy transition happen and things begin slowly. You have this S chip curve where it's kind of the dog leg, and then suddenly it goes parabolic and then it kind of curves back over when you get toward the top. So we have been in for a while now at this bottom of the curve and it looks imperceptible for a long time. When you look at exponential growth trends and you actually see doublings every couple of years, you can actually then kind of see the future a little better as things get to that steep part of the curve. I wrote a book back in 2015 called Solar, Why Our Energy Future is So Bright. And I was a bit of a contrarian back then in terms of projecting really high rates of green energy growth. And history has proven me right. We actually are seeing that really high rate of growth. And we're going to see faster and faster growth in the next decade. And so even though it's a complex message, don't get complacent. Don't sit back and do nothing. We actually are seeing a lot of really positive trends on, like I said, solar power, energy efficiency, wind power, electric vehicles, self-driving vehicles. And I'm actually optimistic by 2030, 2035, we're going to see a predominantly green energy uh, system in the U.S. and probably around the world too. Well, I'm, I wouldn't argue about the U.S. and there's just plenty of momentum going on, and we have a, a president who cares about it, and it's probably in the infrastructure or one of the infrastructure bills, which which would be helpful as um, you know a way to get on our feet about this, uh, and, and a lot of people know about it, and I'm sure you can identify a number of your friends and associates who also have electric cars, as I can. Um, and more all the time. And the automobile dealers are, you know, on board and so forth. But um, the United Nations hasn't done very much. Um, COP hasn't done very much, except, you know, platitudes, I think. And can the United States, even if it realizes all these goals, all these mm, local goals or national goals, can it solve the problem, or do we need to have a global, a global? You know, is Vladimir Putin on board? Uh, is Xi Jinping on board? Are these countries as trying as hard as we wish them to try? And who is overseeing them? Who is, you know, mm, mm, encouraging them, motivating, incentivizing them? Uh, we really need them all to get on board. What's your answer? Yeah, well, Russia is certainly not leading the charge on this stuff, um, but they're also a pretty small emitter as a nation. They're you know, a small economy nowadays. China, of course, is the biggest emitter. They really are the linchpin here. Um, the U.S. was the biggest emitter for a long time. We're now second to China. Um, China has set some very ambitious goals to reduce emissions. Um, I believe they set their peak emissions year to be 2030. And they are seeing massive growth in renewables, but they're also seeing growth in coal power, as a lot of people know and you know, are concerned about. And so it's certainly not a single you know, univocal message here when it comes to China, but I think the trends toward renewables are gonna swamp the trend toward coal power over time. 
because we're seeing coal power retirements in other nations like the US at a really rapid rate. So when you have viable alternatives, um, you can in fact see a lot um, faster improvement in shutting down the old fossil fuel plants if you have viable replacements in time to kind of, you know, meet that demand. So China is trying to kind of have its cake and eat it too by growing, but also leaving the charge on these emissions. And so no one knows, you know, for sure where we're going to see emissions go globally. Um, but it's certainly not the case that China is, you know, a unitary bad actor. They actually are leading a lot of this stuff too. Well, we know they, uh, they want to see their economy do well. And they they want to compete against the United States. That's their big thing. And so, if they had to choose between their economy and um, you know renewable energy, they would probably choose their economy. And that leads and that leads me yeah. you know, that leads me to the question about whether the U.S. is in, in the same place because um, you know COVID has taken a bite out of our economy, it, it, and that's not finished. Um, and so, what you, what you have is an economy that's limping along and that's probably euphemistic it's probably not, not as good as that and it's you know every day you wonder about how the economy in, is doing and so um what's the what's the interaction between the economy and the initiative for uh, clean energy yeah i mean i think it's true that basically any nation would always choose economic growth over the environment um if they really had to make that choice either or. Luckily, it's not either or, right? We're actually now at a point where it's both good for your pocketbook and good for the environment to go green. And so we're now seeing kind of a new race toward who can be uh, the leader on green tech. And a big motivation and part, you know, part of the speech that Biden gave a few days ago on is this new um, EV um, goal by 2030 to have at least half of you know car sales be EVs is talking about maintaining the U.S. competitive lead um, or regaining that lead on EV technology and becoming the main producer around the world. And you know Tesla is in fact the main producer of EVs in the whole world. They are of course a U.S. company. Um, they're leading on many of these issues. And ironically, Tesla was not actually at the, the meeting with Biden, but that was a kind of a union issue, not a Tesla issue per se. Um, so I think where we're seeing things really transition now is that solar power, wind power, EV technology are, have become big industries. And you have to have those become big industries to have world-changing impact. Um, so we really are at a point where the old fossil fuel industries are starting to kind of get pushed back by new industries. And it's been, you know, 20, 30 years to make this change happen, but it is now arriving. Well, you know, one of the things that sticks in my brain is the fact that we give uh, subsidies to the oil industry. We, you know, we're not nearly as uh, generous in terms of, um, uh, you know, renewables. And um, you're into policy, you're into the law for sure. And I wonder what you would recommend uh, to Joe Biden, what, what you would recommend to Congress. That is assuming there still is a Congress. We're not sure that there is a Congress, but assuming that they would, you know, listen to your kind of policy, what would you suggest they do to incentivize, to keep this thing rolling? In fact, to enhance clean energy in as much as possible, because, you know, we agree it's a race against time. Mm -hmm. um, what should the United States do? Because what the United States does is world leadership. It still is world leadership. If, if, we, if we get out and do stuff on climate change, the world will notice. If we generate a, a lot of um, production on electric vehicles, the world will buy those things or copy them. Um, and that, that'll have an effect. We are still a leader. So what do we need to do to preserve that leadership, to enhance that leadership, uh, to push it forward and save the planet. Yeah, well, first, I want to congratulate President Biden on what he did announce a few days ago, which was this 50% by 2030 EV goal. That's a really great step. Now, it's symbolic only. It's an executive order. Uh, but he's also set in place, um, set in motion a process for new standards for vehicles more generally through EPA and NHTSA. And those will basically kick in new cafe centers are called in a couple of years once that process um, is resolved. 
At the same time, what Biden really needs to do and Congress needs to do is renew the various tax credits for electric vehicles uh, and also renewables more generally. Those were in his big infrastructure package, but that part was actually <clears throat> removed in the bipartisan compromise. And so we need to get those back in that bill before it's passed. Hopefully it's not too late for that. Yeah, gee, yeah that's important, really. Too bad it was removed. It, it demonstrates a you know, runway Cargan kind of approach about uh, how to handle this issue. Yeah, it, it's politics, it's partisan, and they were stripped out. There was about almost $400 billion in there in various tax credits. And I'm hoping that some version will get put back in the bill or pass as a separate bill, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing that Biden should do is pass a national renewable energy standard, an RES, to set a basic floor for renewables in each state. Uh, currently, it's set state to state, and I generally agree with states' rights and the ability to set your own goals at a state level. But with this um, issue becoming so important and with renewables becoming so cost effective and actually saving money for consumers, is a very good case being made that the federal government should set a floor now for achieving a certain level of renewables, say you know, one third or one half renewable energy by 2030, that kind of thing. So there's a longer list, but that's I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, well, I hope I hope we can find a way to do that. At the end, it's I say I hate to say this, at the end it's political right now, because yeah. everything is political right now. Um, so one question that arises, we talk about electric vehicles. Um, I'm happy to hear that Tesla is making so many of them. And you 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 sparked my interest in checking out uh, the, the why, the why model. Uh, in any event, um, what about the charging stations? Uh, I would call that infrastructure for sure. Um, and and Buttigieg should be out there trying to build charging stations, shouldn't he? Um, but is there money? Is there legislation? Um, it seems to me that, the, that Joe Biden may or may not be able to pull that off. And we could uh, accelerate, uh, interesting term in this context, mm -hmm. we can accelerate uh, the development of EVs if we could put charging stations everywhere they could possibly be. Yeah, for sure. And so um, Biden's Build Back Better plan um, does call for 500,000 new EV charges around the nation. And this was actually in place before Biden won office. So he's been saying this for quite some time now. He's, of course, been in office now for six months. And he's had a tough road to hoe with the pandemic and a bare majority in Congress. So he hasn't actually put the money behind those goals yet. So I'd say it's a matter of rhetoric needing to be caught up with action. Uh, but of course, it's very early days for his presidency. I'm not going to judge too harshly just yet. I'm optimistic that you know Buttigieg and Biden are both um, trying to make this happen. And of course, it's not just a matter of the feds taking action. We have state level, we have local level, we have private sector efforts already in place doing a lot. We're seeing a whole ton of charges being put in place through those existing forces. A federal push would simply help what's already going on by bringing in more congressional money. And again, setting that top down symbolic level of action, which definitely does help. Yeah, well, too bad, you know, the states get fragmented. We've seen that in so many ways. <clears throat> they could be doing a lot because in, in truth, this is a state issue. It's a, it's a state transportation issue. It doesn't have to be federal. And if both of them did it, that was terrific. That would be terrific. Um, but, you know, it seems to, well, let me ask you this. Is this moving fast enough? Well, that's the question, right? I mean, uh, we don't know. Uh, I think we're moving pretty darn fast. It, it's taken a while to get here. But I think now we are here, we're going to see things really unfold in the 2020s. Um, we have basically a decade of EVs uh, rolling out. I think we're going to see by 2030, probably, frankly, more than 50% of new car sales come from EVs. Um, just the market is heading that way so significantly. You're going to have a whole new crop of pickup trucks electric pickup trucks coming out. The um, Cybertruck from Tesla, the F-150 electric from Ford, the Rivian pickup truck, these are going to be massive bestsellers. And so we've already seen, you know, for example, Tesla's Model 3 sedan, and then their Model Y is a crossover SUV. Soon they're going to have the Cybertruck, which is kind of a bit of a niche vehicle because it's so funny looking, but they've already got over a million pre-orders, by far the most in history. And again, the F-150 and the Rivian are going to be huge bestsellers. 
So I'm optimistic in the next few years, we're going to see a real shift. And once you see, you know, the average um, dude in Texas, you know, bragging about the new F-150 electric, the game's won. You know, that's when everyone's yeah. like, oh, of course we're going to be electric. Why not? Yeah. You're going to have engines yeah. everywhere. It's going to be a lot faster. You're going to have 400 miles of range for your vehicle. It'll be kind of the new default. I'm not holding my breath on Texas. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> or on its governor, by the way. Um, so, you know, what's, what's interesting um, is that um, it, we had another, another scientist in our movie who talked about, you know, how you had to change your life, you know, a lot, like not eat so much meat, uh, like not, not, not buy things that required a lot of energy to produce um, and, and orient your, your, your whole life experience. And, and what he said was that we we need to do a complete makeover um, in terms of the you know the, the social and business and consumption aspect of our of our society in order to in order to beat this thing. It is not just EVs. It is, for that matter, it's not just energy. It's everything. We have to reorder, and I'm using his words, reorder our entire society. So where does this fit? Because there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of, what do you want to call it? Negative climate change um, phenomena that have nothing to do with energy or transportation or, um, you know, generation of the lights in our homes. Uh, it's a lifestyle thing. Where does that fit? Yeah, well, I, I agree in general, we need to be cognizant of everything we do, um, but I'm wary of calling for things like a reordering, because I think you got to keep in mind the other half of the country who hear those kind of words and it raises their hackles. And I think to bring people along, we need to be aware that not everyone um, thinks like we do. And I think we need to um, basically use the least coercive measures possible and lead with voluntary calls for voluntary change. Um, it's a complex debate like all those things are, but in terms of like diet, for example, I've been vegan-ish now for a few years. Um, and even we're using the term vegan sounds silly to a lot of people because it seems so extreme. Is that but because of climate change or health? It's all the above, it's health, um, environment, and um, ethics for me. And so I'm vegan-ish because I've now experimented in many different ways over the years with different diets and vegan-ish actually to me is sustainable. And by vegan-ish, I mean, I'm mostly vegan, but I allow myself um, meat and fish and eggs and dairy occasionally. And so I generally, you know, plants and, and starches and fruits, um, but I have, um, you know, meats or fish maybe a couple times a week. And this feels to me pretty sustainable and pretty healthy. And it definitely is far less in terms of the emissions produced by the food that I eat personally than the average American diet, which is pretty meat and fish heavy. Um, so I think we all need to kind of look at this stuff, think of what works for us, what's actually sustainable for us, because a lot of people will kind of get into this space and are like, okay, I'm gonna go cold turkey and become fully vegetarian or vegan, do that for a week, and then they're back to the regular diet because they can't do it sustainably. So you really gotta kind of think, kind of find things that work for you personally, but are still uh, helping with the overall issues and being part of the solution. One other sacred cow issue I'd like to ask you about is the comparison of um, the energy we use for our homes and for all the appliances we have and the computers, the machinery, you know, we use a lot of it. And we it's generated, at least in Hawaii, largely by coal still. We're trying to get off that. Uh, and other places, it's not necessarily renewable. Um, but in the end, uh, if we make it all renewable, um, whatever expense that may involve, whatever disruption to the economy that may involve, whatever political issues that may involve, that will be a lot better than going on coal or non-renewable sources. And it seems to me, actually, Tam, that that is more important than electric vehicles, because the amount of energy that I use on my appliances every day in my home and my office and whatever I do these days, you know, in the in the 21st century is far more than what I use driving. Uh, is there any truth to that? 
Yeah, well, let's look at Hawaii um, in general. Uh, so coming from the national to the state level. Um, in Hawaii, about one fourth of our emissions come from our cars. So it is not the single biggest item. Um, it is a, I think it's a plurality where um, it's not the majority, but it's still a very large chunk. So yes, our appliance use and our electricity use in general um, does comprise more emissions than what we drive. But of course in Hawaii, we've got small islands we live on. We don't drive as much as other places. Um, so all that said, in Hawaii, we do have a mandate to actually achieve 100% renewable electricity by 2045. Personally, I think that's too far away. I think we can do better than that. And we actually are working on a bill right now, you know, with my, my, my hat for Think Big, which is a nonprofit I began last year, um, looking at local policy. We're pushing for a bill at the county level to require that the county facilities themselves become fully renewable by 2030. And we're urging that to happen as a way to spur more rapid change at the state level. And so we're hoping that by 2035 or 2040, the entire state can achieve that 100% renewables goal. We are seeing a lot of larger scale solar. Uh, we've got wind power, of course, uh, pretty abundant in some parts of the islands, Hawaii Island where I live in particular. Um, so we, we certainly can reach that goal in Hawaii, but places like Oahu are more tricky because of course Oahu is much smaller, but has a much larger population. So achieving 100% renewables in Oahu is a tougher road to hoe, um, but it is doable. Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, public public opinion. And we talked about a, that a little bit before. And I think there's a certain amount of resistance or what do I call it? Um, you know, we don't care. Complacency about this. They don't see it as important. Maybe they don't read those articles uh, about the New York Times and the Washington Post warning us yet again that this is the you know highest threat facing humanity. Um, but how do you get public opinion to push the legislature or whoever, whoever in the government is making such decisions um, to actually get on board and go faster? Uh, because right now, there's a, there's a, you'll have to agree with me, there's a fair amount of complacency here and on the mainland. And I would say um, this, it's, got a, it's got a significant element of you know, politics in it that's carried over from the Trump administration. So, so query, how do you change that? Are you doing anything to change public opinion? Um, yes, I am personally. I mean, I write about this stuff quite a bit. And um, you know, like I said, I wrote a book about this stuff. Um, I've got a nonprofit. I'm in the green energy policy space which is more policy focused than you know, public um, media messaging. But I do a lot of this stuff in different ways. And what I've seen again in the last 10 years is a massive shift toward people recognizing this is a real issue. And I think where we are now is that most people are gonna agree, yes, climate change is a real issue, but we're not at a point where most people are taking personal action or electing people based on their climate policy views. And so, you know, my friends and family have a very mixed record on things like, you know, buying hybrid cars or electric vehicles. Um, I've got a bunch of friends who do have electric vehicles, uh, but far from a majority. And I think at this point, you know, when we do buy a new car, uh, we really need to be looking first and foremost at the, you know, non-emitting burdens. And that's just one thing we had to kind of think about and say, look, I'm not going to buy that super Outback, even though it's a cool car. I'm going to and, you know, a non-emitting car. You mentioned wind, you know, and, and wind is probably a good example of, uh, it's not complacency so much as opposition. Um, you have a perfectly ordinary community. Uh, and at first they, they might be on board about wind. Next time you look, they're not on board about wind uh, and they oppose, um, you know, bringing the, the sections of the wind turbines in. Uh, they stand in the street to, to, to obstruct. Um, they have protests and the like, and wind doesn't come in. Um, <clears throat> it just doesn't come in. We don't have as much wind as we could have. And the other uh, part of that uh, is that, um, you know, you, 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 we could have a state that's all wired up together. We could have a state where we pass uh, generated power from one island to another, but it seems that that, that issue is radioactive. And it's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and the reason it's not going to happen is that there was all this, um, what do you want to call it, protest 
Uh, maybe it's NIMBY protest, but it's nevertheless um, protest. So, I mean, what we have is, and, and then, you know, geothermal is another example of a renewable, a dispatchable renewal, you know, renewable, a really good one, in my opinion. Um, and there, there are people who oppose it. Uh, and there are other examples, too. But what I'm saying is that there, it's not so much complacency for some people on some projects. It's, it's a downright opposition. Um, they, they don't mind holding it up forever. And how do you change that? Yeah, it's a tough question. And I think in terms of um, <clears throat> things like wind power or geothermal, it really is a, a localized, sorry. <clears throat> it's a localized decision and a lot of people are gonna be in theory supportive, but then in actuality, <clears throat> less supportive. And I think how it changes is you simply have a discussion over time and people get more and more on board over time. And you can't force it. You have these kind of bring people along as best you can. Mm, now that's the recipe for learning the hard way. So, you know, it, it strikes me, I'm just scanning my own memory to think of a particular candidate who ran for office, um, who ran for office at any level of the state, say, say uh, a county government or state, state uh, governor alike. And they have a lot of platforms, but i I'm not sure I can remember any one of them who stands out as a, as a kind of candidate that you would vote for simply because he understood or she understood how important the issue is and how much we have to do uh, to keep on the track. Um, wouldn't it be, do you expect, wouldn't it be great if somebody would stand up and say, this is my primary issue. This is the primary um, you know, threat and uh, this is therefore my primary issue, and I'm going to carry this all the way. We don't have that, do we? We haven't had it yet, no. And I think you're right. I think probably time is right for that to happen. It's just simply, it's one of the many issues out there. And um, certainly people are getting more and more um, concerned about it. And politicians are making it more and more, you know, a, a higher item on their list. But yeah, I don't know anyone who's actually made it their primary issue yet so far. You're right. Strikes me we have more and more indications, as, as indicated in those articles in the Times and the Post, more and more indications uh, that our world is um, under attack, that there are huge threats um, to our quality of life. Um, and they're happening. They're happening now. And, and I, I like to think that you know, people will see that. They'll see the fires. Um, they'll see the, the water shortages and the floods. And, and the environmental disruptions uh, and degradation all over the world. And they'll say, ooh, we better get on this. Um, because as it gets worse, then theoretically, people should be more responsive. Everybody should be more responsive. Do you see that happening uh, now? Um, or is it still a threat in the future? So I think Biden won partly because he did actually make climate change a real priority for him on his platform. And of course, he was running against someone who was very anti-climate change as the real issue, uh, President Trump. So I think it definitely is changing. And I think we're going to see more of that as we see more and more of this kind of messaging uh, come out and become more serious in people's minds. Hope so. You know, I mean, when you, when you see half of the Pacific Northwest burning, uh, you say to yourself, hmm. And I, and I think a press has a role in this, don't you think? I mean, uh, it, sometimes it troubles me that you have a, a wildfire that, you know, covers hundreds, thousands of acres, uh, and nobody says this, this is climate change. And yet you and I know it instantly, don't we? It's climate change, right? Well, that's the difference in this uh, major report from the IPCC is that they're saying now, look, in the past, we've been unable to really kind of pin particular events on climate change. And they're saying now, given the attribution of science, we can actually say with more certainty, these kinds of events are unusual and gonna happen with more frequency. And they basically, you, you can never say for sure, look, this is because of climate change in terms of this actual event, because of course, fires happened before there's climate change from humankind and our activities. But when you see them happening more and more frequency and more and more severity, that's when you can say, look, these things are basically attributable in part to climate change. I'll tell you what I think it's going to really take. Um, it's going to it's going to raise public interest and public concern 
is, is in the food chain. If we yeah. find out that the supply lines are deteriorated and that certain kinds of foods are unavailable because of climate change, because of the degradation of the environments in which that, that food is grown, um, then we're going to start thinking seriously. We see the price of, of whatever it is go up dramatically, and um, we associate that with um, the environment, um, then we're going to get more concerned. That's what I think is going to... You agree? Yeah. I think everything that happens like this, in terms of you know fires and floods and more and more disasters that we can reasonably say are due at least in part to climate change, more and more people are like, well, okay, what are we going to do about it? And that extends not to just making personal shifts, like I said, buying an electric vehicle or riding a bike more or eating less meat, but also to like the politicians who actually make these issues, you know, top of their list. And that's why it has not happened today so far. Like I said, Biden did certainly campaign on climate change in a way that you didn't see in prior presidential cycles, um, but it was not his main issue. Um, but he definitely, he made it a serious issue and he's now hopefully going through the implementation phase of his rhetoric from the campaign. Yeah, well, it's got to stay high on the list of priorities because it is the most threatening thing we have. Thank you very much, Sam, for coming on. Uh, you want to make any closing pitch to the world here? What is what? What would you leave them with today? Yeah, well, I, I guess I'll close with kind of this um, this middle ground message that I like to really kind of emphasize. Don't become complacent. Don't become full of despair. But take action personally and elect good politicians who are going to take action on our behalf collectively. There's that middle ground between you know, informed action and becoming is so full of despair that you can't do anything. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you very much. Tam Hunt, uh, an environmental and energy lawyer and policy man. And uh, keep, keep doing your work. And we'll, we'll circle back and find out how these things are doing later. Thank you Thank so much, Tim. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Aloha.